God is a genius at turning curses into blessings. And that's something that is true concerning what he is doing in you and also what he is doing for you. This is going to be absolutely a powerful recreation of the way you look at life, the way you look at yourself, and the way you look at negative things that you face during your earthly sojourn. God is a genius at turning curses into blessings. And that is actually one of the titles that rests upon you and the entirety of the body of Christ. God refers to us as a blessing. So let me define that term. What is a blessing? A blessing is anything that brings happiness, fulfillment, benefit, prosperity, or completion into a person's life. But when you refer to an individual as a blessing, it means any human vessel through which God extends his gifts, love, favor, goodness, mercy, all his divine nature and attributes, they flow through you to impact the lives of others. And by that action of God in you and through you, you're changing a cursed world and invading it with the blessings of God until it finally shifts altogether and the curse is canceled. We are part of a purpose and a process that is powerful. And God is a genius at executing this process and turning curses into blessings. All right? When you, for instance, do simple things, like you just greet someone and say, God bless you, that's an invocation. That's a prayerful appeal to God to bring happiness and completion and blessing and healing and peace and joy and love and all the good things of God into the life of that person. What a powerful way of either greeting someone when you meet them or exiting from that person's presence. God bless you is not a powerless statement. It is a powerful statement. And those who are called of God to be a blessing have the power to confer a blessing. Let me give you a great scripture, phenomenal scripture that illustrates this. It's Zechariah chapter 8, verse 13. Now, this is, of course, an Old Testament passage referring to the children of Israel. And God said, it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Israel, and house, O house of Judah, and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear, let your hands be strong. Now, what was God referring to? It shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah, and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. There's really two levels on which that was fulfilled. First of all, they became an example of a cursed people because they sinned atrociously against God. They went after false gods. They turned their back on the Torah and failed to align themselves with the will of God and the word of God. And consequently, they suffered as a result. And their enemies came, conquered them, and carried them away into captivity. They were slaves in Babylon. But after the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire, they were released to come back and rebuild the temple. And that was the temple that existed when Jesus walked on the earth. And so God was saying, you were cursed because of your sin, your idolatry, your failure to adhere to the law, and you were scattered in all nations as a result and became an example of a cursed people among them in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 28. And I'll pull out a couple of choice passages in just a moment. But then God saved them in a natural sense. He saved them from Babylonian captivity. He brought them back to the land of Israel, and they restored and rebuilt the temple of Solomon, and greater glory came to that temple 
than they had at its dedication when the glory of God swept in the temple and the priest could not even stand up to minister. However, God takes us from glory to glory. That was glorious, but it was even more glorious that God came in a human body in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ and preached the gospel in the temple area once it was restored and once God had canceled the curse and poured out his blessing again. Now, all of that was illustrated in another very powerful scripture. And that is, uh, that is found in Malachi, uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, where God told the children of Israel, and this was 400 years before the coming of the Lord, approximately, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and prove me now or try me now in this. Put me to the test, God says, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing where there won't be room enough to receive it. What a fantastic statement. I was studying that statement years ago, though, and I said, God, when did this happen? Because you don't make a promise unless you fulfill it. And right after this promise was given, there was 400 years of prophetic silence. And during those four centuries, Israel was dominated by foreign powers. And uh, they were slaves to the Grecians and then slaves to the Romans. There was only about 100 years of freedom where the Maccabee revolt took place. But even then, there was a lot of strife and stress in the land because of the oppression of foreign powers. I don't see any time of overflowing blessing during those four centuries. But God gave a promise. He said, if you'll bring all the tithes into the storehouse, in other words, if you will support the faith of your fathers, if you will support the temple, if you will support the priesthood, if you will support the proclamation of the Torah, then if you don't give up on the support of God's work, even during 400 years of oppression, there's going to come a pivotal point where overflowing blessing comes because God is a genius at turning curses into blessings. So one day I was praying about it. I said, Lord, when did you fulfill this? And God said, turn the page. I was actually reading a Bible, a literal book, and not just reading it online or on my computer. And I turned the page. The Holy Spirit said, turn another page. And I turned another page. And my eyes fell on the passage where John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus and the windows of heaven opened and the glory of God poured down. The Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. And God said that's when it happened. Because they, through their financial support, through their adherence to biblical principles, Old Testament biblical principles, they preserved a belief system until the coming of the Messiah. And then when the Messiah came, the blessing came down on him that was too great to be contained within Judaism. And it overflowed the banks of Judaism into every kindred and nation and tongue and people right into your life and to my life as well and reached around the world. It was actually the fulfillment of an original proclamation God made over Abraham. And that's fantastic. Let's go back to that. In fact, let's go back to that paradigm shift that took place in one individual's life that ended up a global paradigm shift in the day we're living in. And this illustrates how God turns a curse into a blessing. And in a major way, that happened for Abram, later to be known as Abraham. Let me take you to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And this is where God first revealed himself to this great patriarch of Israel. The Lord said to Abram, get out from your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Another passage says all nations of the earth. So all cultural groups, all racial groups, all national groups are going to be blessed as a result of this one lone man who doesn't even have a child yet. Isn't God amazing? His wife is barren, and later on, uh, he most likely came to a place of impotence in his life because the Bible said he considered not his own body now dead, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So God allowed this thing to progress to a stage of impossibility, and then he canceled the curse because a barren woman in that day was considered cursed. The blessing of God from Genesis was procreative power. Uh, God blessed Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply. And so one major sign of the blessing of God was offspring, see? And so if you didn't have offspring, something was wrong somewhere, or people assumed that. It's not necessarily that way, but people would assume that. But God said to Abram, get out from your country, out from your kindred, out from your father's house. Why? because his family were all idolaters. And according to Jewish history, his father was actually an idol maker. Interestingly, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God proclaims a curse on those who worship idols, and especially those who make idols, down to the third and fourth generation. And so Abraham's offspring should have been cursed. Abraham should have been, or Abram, as he was known originally until God changed his name, should have been cursed, and then he should have passed on a curse to any offspring he had. And of course, the next was Isaac, and the next was Jacob for this blessing of Abraham to pass down through. They should have all been cursed, not blessed, because God in Deuteronomy 5 proclaimed a curse to the third and fourth generation. Joseph should have been cursed instead of blessed. But see, Abram responded to God in faith and became Abraham, father of a multitude. God gave him that name as a prophetic statement over his life. And the curse ended with him. You ought to make that proclamation. The curse ends with me. Because maybe you had people in your family line that rebelled against God and suffered the consequences and passed on a certain kind of curse to their offspring, but you don't have to succumb to that. And you certainly are not uh, a slave to that. You have been delivered from not only your past, but your family's past. God's canceled the curse and turned you into a blessing. What an amazing thing that a little man living in a tent, passing through a wilderness area, could have global impact. And yet that's what the blessing does when God pours out his blessing upon his people. Now, this has been fulfilled in you in a major way personally, and it's been fulfilled in me. Let me take you back to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 13. God said, even as you were a curse among the nations, among the heathen, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Well, that's true personally for me. When I was growing up, I was raised Catholic and I never heard about being born again. They believe when a child is sprinkled in infant baptism, that child is born again. That's not when it happens. They believe in the sacrament of confirmation. When the bishop lays hands on you, you receive the Holy Spirit. That did not happen until many years later when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And what they said happened when I was sprinkled as an infant did not happen until I received the Lord Jesus into my heart at the age of 19. And so it was somewhat of a curse. It was a mixture, really. It was a blessing to hear some elements of Christianity promoted, like the historical fact of Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of humanity, rising from the dead, ascending to heaven, and the 
the promise of his return. All of that was a blessing, but it was just in a historical context, not a living reality in my life until much later on. So that belief system was filled with error. And yet now I can share the gospel with Catholics and have an impact. In fact, we're about to launch a project to reach Catholics around the globe. I'm writing a new book called The Beliefs and Practices of the Catholic Church, and the subtitle is 25 Questions from a Former Catholic Who Loves Catholic. So the darkness becomes light. The curse becomes a blessing. God used that experience to empower me to reach back into the same darkness and bring others out because there's millions of sincere Catholics that need to be born again that will receive that message if they hear it properly presented. And then when I had a near-death experience, unfortunately at the age of 18, uh, a year prior to being born again, I started searching for truth and got involved in Eastern religions. I was a student of an Indian guru. I studied Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, meditation, new age spirituality. I was involved in all kinds of occult practices, trying to find ultimate truth and God consciousness. It was totally erroneous spiritually, and it was a portal into demonic influence in my life, which is all a curse. But when I came to Jesus, he being a genius at turning curses into blessings, took my past and used it to empower me to be effective in my future. And I've held crusades, outdoor meetings in India where thousands, literally tens of thousands of people attended and many thousands were saved. Praise God. And we have our outreach to people of that mindset on the website, thetruelight.net. And Thousands of people from all over the world, people from over a hundred nations have downloaded my story of how I was a, a teacher of yoga and meditation at four universities and how I ran a yoga ashram. And then in one day's time, everything changed. And that's compiled in a little mini book called The Highest Adventure Encountering God. And it's a free download, a free ebook on thetruelight.net. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world, over a hundred nations have downloaded that book, over a quarter of a million hits on that website. So what was a curse, God took it and said, watch me do what I can do best. And he turned it into a blessing because God does not always call the qualified, but he always qualifies the called. And quite often how he does that is to take your past negative experiences cancel them with his influence and turn the negative, the subtraction sign, into a positive, an addition sign. And he uses it to add value to your life. And I can go back even further. When I was a teenager, I was a rock musician and unfortunately involved somewhat in drug use. And I was a curse to other people because I influenced them to both of those things. I influenced them toward rock music. I influenced them toward the use of drugs. So I was a curse to them. But God said, I'm going to save you and you shall be a blessing. And the amazing thing about God is he uses the cursed aspect of your life to empower you to be a blessing. And a couple of years after I got saved, for about 10 years, we held drug abuse assemblies in high schools all over the country. I had a whole team of former addicts, former drug users, some of them were musicians and singers. Some of them gave their testimony. And we literally saw over 70,000 high school students come to the Lord Jesus Christ when I stopped counting. And it was thousands after that. So God is a genius at turning curses into blessings. Why don't you look back in your past, look at all the negatives, and then ask God to slash it with his cancel and then turn the subtraction sign into an addition sign. Now, this was illustrated on a higher level than any other I could go to in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
because when he came, of course, he was the means by which the Abrahamic blessing was going to extend to all nations. However, however, he had to go through the stage of becoming a curse so that he could become a blessing. And that's exemplary of, of what most of us are pastors. Some of you were raised in church, never went through a stage of rebellion, and that's an even greater testimony. But let me read Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Listen closely. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what does that mean, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us? The curse of the law is best summarized in Deuteronomy 27, 26. That's the verse where God said, Cursed is he who confirms not all the words of this law to do them. In the law, which is a reference to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, there were 613 commandments, 365 negative commandments and 248 positive commandments. The negative ones are thou shalt not, and the positive are thou shalt. And God said in Deuteronomy 26, 27, verse 26, that a curse would come upon anyone who fails to keep all of those commandments, which is a high bar that most human beings, well, really just about all human beings, could not completely successfully reach. But God needed to show us how unattainable this place of perfection and righteousness is by human effort. And he accomplished that through the giving of the law. And so there was a curse on all mankind, beginning with Adam, who passed on a curse to his offspring, and that curse was death. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Well, Adam was cursed first, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and then his body had a lower nature full of cravings and desires that warred against the laws of God. And so he was cursed with a lower nature as well, and then cursed with death physically and ultimately the second death, which is both soul and body in the lake of fire. How awful is that? But Jesus drew all of that curse, not only from Adam, but from all his billions of offspring in the past and yet to be born in the future. And all of that converged on the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And the blessing the Son of God who came from heaven became a curse and tasted death for every man. He assumed the judgment we should have received so that the curse could become a blessing. He was made a curse for us. He didn't just bear the curse. He became a curse. But when he did, it conquered the stronghold of cursedness in this world. That whole thing crumbled and collapsed for those who make him the head of their lives. And that's a wonderful and glorious thing. Now, as I mentioned, the outcome of the curse is death, right? In all its many facets. So we're constantly battered by that still, even though I'm a blessed person, you and I, even though you're a blessed person, are battered with death dealing elements from the world, temptations, trials, disappointments, heartache, grief, betrayal, all kinds of negative things happen to us that tear at the soul. However, God has promised not only that he would turn you into a blessing if you were a curse prior to salvation, he switches it, turns it around, and you become a blessing, but also everything that comes against you that is cursed in nature. God cancels it and turns it into a blessing. That's what Romans 8, 28 is all about. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And the next verse says, for whom he did foreknow, 
he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And so the primary way the curse is canceled and the blessing is installed is the fallen nature of Adam is removed, or at least its dominance is removed in your life. You're born again, you receive a new nature, and in the place of a dominant Adam nature, there is a dominant divine nature that subjects the Adam nature. And of course, all of that will culminate as something called the resurrection. In fact, we need to go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. This will bless you because, as I said, the ultimate consequence of the curse is death in all its many forms. And finally, in all of our lives, unless we're alive when Jesus comes again, the grave will pull us into its influence and our physical bodies will die. Our soul will be released to be in the presence of God at that moment but our physical bodies will die. However, Revelation 14, 13, John heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So it's a dual blessing. The first aspect of the blessing is final ultimate peace and rest in God. No conflict, no pressure, no stress. But the second aspect of the blessing is everything you did in this life to be a blessing is going to return to you eternally. The reward for what you have done in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to really focus in on this because the greatest sign of the lingering of the curse in this world is the fact that all human beings have to die. However, for you and for me and for everyone who's born again and serving the Lord and in Christ, God is a genius at turning that curse, physical death, into a blessing. Because to be absent from the body, Paul said, is far better because it's to be present with the Lord in paradise. And so God takes the worst thing that can happen to you and turns it into the best thing that could happen to you. Even though it's hard for us to see that when a loved one dies, it's hard to see that when a dear friend passes on. Still, if we see it from God's perspective, the curse has become a blessing. So this is true not only concerning what God does in you, but what God does for you. Follow the life of any blessed person in the Bible, and you'll see how God is a genius at turning curses into blessings over and over and over again. The pattern is revealed. Look at Joseph. It was a curse that his brothers plotted to kill him. It was a curse that they sold him into slavery. It was a curse that he was enslaved by Potiphar, the captain of the guard under Pharaoh. It was a curse that Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and then falsely accused him when he refused her advances. It was a curse that he got thrown in a, an Egyptian prison, Pharaoh's dungeon. It was a curse that the butler and the baker forgot about him for two years. They never mentioned him. Of course, one of them was executed and the other lived, but he forgot about the prophecy Joseph gave. So curse after curse after curse after curse after curse was leading up to the genius of God being released and turning all those curses into a blessing. And that's why Joseph said to his brethren, when the famine was on, a seven-year-long famine that he had prepared for for seven years by uh, saving the uh, product of the crops of Egypt and also Gentile lands where they would bring it as payment in some ways, uh, he saved all that for years so that when the famine came, he could distribute it, not only to the Egyptians, but to the nations. Praise God. And so he told his brethren, he said, you intended evil against me, but God meant that for good to save much people alive. And you can say the same thing. Everything that's been intended to bring forth evil, evil attacks on your life, will ultimately bring forth good. All things work together for good, and God is a genius at turning curses into blessings. Chew on that. Ponder that. Meditate on that. 
assimilate that into your prayer life and into your conscious awareness of what God intends to do in your life. And I guarantee you, you will never be the same. That's who you are. That's one of your God-given names. You are a blessing.